Good afternoon and welcome to the Itaconix PLC investor presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab situated on the right hand corner of your screen. Simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand you over to John Shaw, CEO. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. We're excited to be here. Um, I'm joined by our uh, chair, uh, Dr. Peter uh, Neuenheisen. Um, we have um, Laura Denner. Uh, we are coming live from London here. Laura Denner is actually back in our offices uh, in New Hampshire, so uh, she won't be live on this one, but is present on it. Um, we're here today to talk about um, some exciting developments that we've had both uh, in our commercial progress last year uh, and then in the last uh, couple of weeks in terms of our capital uh, our capital structure uh, and building uh, for the future. <clears throat> uh, we have a standard disclaimer uh, regarding uh, anything we present today. Uh, and again, it'll be uh, myself, uh, CEO, and then Peter Neuenheisen, who's our chair. Uh, most important one to talk about today is that we did uh, had our general meeting today. Uh, we did uh, complete approval for all the shares that we need uh, to complete the $10.5 million in gross proceeds uh, fundraise. Um, that was announced about an hour and a half ago, uh, the results of positive results from it. Uh, what we had out of it was uh, two parts. One was an oversubs oversubscribed placing. Um, for about $10.3 million, I believe, 10.3 million pounds uh, for both new and existing institutional holders. Um, and we did complete an open offer to make sure that all of our existing shareholders had an opportunity to participate. What it's done for us is really put us in a tremendous position um, to grow to, for our next chapter of growth. When we talk about um, Idacon, kind of completing Idacon 2.0, when we took our technology, 1.0 was to take our technology uh, and make it into ingredients. Uh, we picked out three areas in cleaning, beauty, and um, hygiene uh, to get to a, a stable level and growing level of our base revenues of it, which we've achieved. And now we have the funding to be able to move off uh, into um, even more exciting times and future growth uh, with what we've completed today. Um, along the way, we've also been able to rebuild our shareholder base. Um, uh, we've now, will at the end of this, we'll have uh, a, a, a significantly larger institutional shareholder base. Um, I think over 40%, maybe about 50% uh, at the end of this will be uh, both new uh, and existing uh, institutions uh, uh, that we've been able to rebuild, which is a key objective for us. So it's a very exciting time for the company uh, to complete uh, uh, to com complete this fundraise and position us for future growth. The use of proceeds um, on it in terms of it's a significant amount of money relative to what we've had in the past. Um, it was important for us to do as we our revenues got higher uh, and what our capital needs would be in terms of most importantly just working capital. Um, some of it's just for our uh, a, 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 another short period of uh, of, profit, of, of operating losses for a relatively short period, but even more important, um, we uh, have the working capital to uh, restructure how we manage our inventories uh, and our payables and our receivables. Um, one is most very important for us is that um, in the past we've looked in terms of both our customers and our and, and our vendors in terms of uh, buying our, around terms, not necessarily always getting the best price, but in terms of uh, what what payable days, receivable days we would have, and we can change that now, and we think that will help our, our gross profit margins moving forward. Uh, second of all, we've uh, similar to what we talked about last April when we uh, did a, a relatively small fundraise uh, with IP Group, uh, myself and Laura Denner, um, uh, Europe is growing significantly for us, um, and we are gonna be repositioning finished goods inventory uh, into Europe so that we can maintain the service levels uh, to our current and uh, future EU customers to maintain short, shorter delivery times, um, higher reliability of when we get products into them as they start relying on our ingredients more and more for their products. Um, so first and most important was the increased capital. 
Um, second of all, the area is uh, that we, we can increase our customer support for our current ingredients. Um, when we approach a customer, there's often a lot of testing um, that we need to show, that we'd like to show um, as customers consider our ingredients versus some other alternative uh, ingredients. And the more testing that we can have, the more verified testing in terms of how, our, how to show why our ingredients work better in their products, the better we can do. And we're going to be able to have a little bit more money to be able to do that. We'll also be able to accelerate some of our uh, revenue development uh, of looking at new applications for our existing ingredients. Uh, and more important, to be able to advance uh, further products out of our technology platform uh, into uh, new ingredients and bring products forward. Um, and that we don't, will not have any limits there, uh, the limits we've had in the past in terms of how many products we can bring forward on it. Uh, and last, um, we will do some slight increase in terms of our capital spending to support our revenue growth. Uh, some improvements, there's uh, continuous improvements to do our, to our current production capacity. Um, we are uh, not planning to do any, uh, add any production capacity outside of our plant in uh, North America. Um, but within that plant, uh, as we add more products uh, and expand the number of products that we make uh, with our existing production capacity, there are uh, continuous improvements and modifications that we can make uh, to our uh, existing production line uh, to improve the efficiency and improve the capacity uh, of what we have. Uh, and then uh, last is that um, every time we bring a new product forward, um, whether it be the, uh, the new product, some of the new products we bring forward in, in hair care or other areas, usually every new chemistry has some new process chemical process that we need to do to modify the chemistry beyond just our base production capacity. Um, and this will allow this, uh, we will be allowed to bring, uh, be more aggressive in developing processes for optimizing uh, and controlling more of the production of new products as we go forward, which has been a key constraint for us of bringing new products forward. So all of these are really game changing for us in terms of how we can operate our business uh, with a stronger balance sheet uh, in place. Uh, and, uh, from now and uh, well into the future on it. When we think about the development of the company, um, you know, we, uh, our roots start uh, uh, around bringing polymers from itaconic acid to the market. The roots, remember, start back 60 years ago um, when uh, Pfizer and then maybe 30 years ago, 35 years ago when Roman Haas tried to bring uh, polymers of itaconic acid forward, and we had a breakthrough about ten, about fourteen years ago when we founded uh, Itaconics Corporation uh, that we actually had the economic breakthrough to do it. Um, when I talked about Iconics 1.0, is kind of from when we were founded until 2014 was really finding exactly where the chemistry applied to certain types of ingredients, of whether we, where we could bring performance, safety, cost advantages, and sustainability to certain markets market segments. And uh, by 2018, we picked out the areas that uh, are key areas to focus on uh, and rebuilt the company from 2018 forward uh, around uh, cleaning, uh, beauty, and, um, and hygiene. Uh, and what we've done now is really with the revenues that we've achieved, um, now really kind of exiting that phase of where we've now established a very strong base of revenues around those core um, areas that we focused on um, over the last four years, and we're now in position to expand out into the much broader areas that we can do uh, with our chemistries of it. Um, one of the great um, uh, exciting parts as we enter what I could call Itaconics 3.0 uh, was having uh, Dr. Uh, Peter Neuenheisen join our board. Uh, he's one of, uh, has known us for many years, uh, has been one of most, uh, uh, has an excellent technical mind. He was former CTO of Axon Bell Specialty Chemicals. Um, and um, understands our chemistries and shares our excitement around our chemistries. Uh, to, so to have Peter on board uh, starting last summer has been a very important part of um, how we enter the, our next era, uh, next stage of growth. Thank you. Uh, thank you, John. And uh, yeah, just like to tell everybody how excited I am to be here today, today with you as we are closing such an important uh, achievement for uh, for the company. 
And once again, my appreciation to you personally, John, but also to the entire Iconics team that we uh, that, that we got here, um, as well as to everybody you know, around us here in London that has helped uh, make this uh, come together. So it's it's really uh, a special day for all of us Iconics investors like yourself um, and and myself uh, to be uh, to be here. And I'd like to just make. Um, you know, with, with my chemistry background and having worked in Oxford Nobel for, for quite a number of years, maybe make two important points, uh, and, and you, you probably know it, but it's good to emphasize. Um, so first of all, itaconics and, and itaconic acid is a platform. It's a platform molecule. It has been identified already quite a number of years ago as one of those 20-ish you know, molecules that could really become a mainstay of a future bio-based or circular chemical industry. Um, and and in, in that, um, uh, Itaconics has really shown that we have made those steps. It has developed three important technologies already. But if you look at how the chemical industry is constructed, and if you then look at the addressable market, um, which we estimate right now at about 20 million, predominantly made up of acrylic acid and styrene. You can also see this is a massive market. As I said, 20, uh, 20 billion uh, for sure that, uh, that, that we identified. Um, and if you look at the history of those markets, they started like itaconic acid, like itaconics is right now doing. You develop a molecule, you develop um, a polymer, and then you see, hey, can I use it in this application, in that application? Once you start to show that you can use it in three applications, you know you can roll this out into the very many applications that you see here on the screen in, in food and ag agriculture, in paints and coatings, and there are literally hundreds of different applications. And that is the story of itaconic acid going forward. That is the story of Itaconics going forward. We have proven this technology in three applications and going forward, we will roll out quite a number more in this um, very large market. Yeah, it is important when we think about the monomers is that um, although we talk about it being plant food, the Itaconic acid is produced as a natural metabolite. Actually, all of our bodies have Itaconic acid and we produce it uh, as uh, mammals on it, but it's also Commercial production is by fermentation, um, that uh, it's well-established fermentation in it. Um, so that's good, but when, when you think about the importance going forward, what I think about, and I think we, we think about, is just the safety aspect of it. So when you start looking at acrylic acid uh, applications, styrene applications, and maybe you could describe you know, the, the, those pictograms we have up there about the GASS health and safety pictograms, those are really important when you think not just about you know, the sustainability, but even more important is this the safety that we can bring to the yeah, world. Yeah, no, absolutely. And the, the reality is styrene and acrylic acid, truly fossil ingredients derived from, from oil and gas. And then there is hazard. There are people in manufacturing plants all around the world that are not imminently not directly exposed to these uh, to, to these ingredients to these raw materials but there are always emissions and there's always the, uh, the the danger of an accident and a leak happening at which point you are exposing humans as well as uh, as, as well as the planet to these hazardous chemicals and itaconic acid is an enormous step forward so if you think about it if we had itaconic acid a little pile of itaconic acid here no issue. We could sit here, you could eat it, nothing from it. If you had a bottle of acrylic acid, you'd be running, you'd be heading for the door because of that very bad odor type. And if it was styrene, we'd be running for the door. That's just the nature of the safety of the underlying uh, underlying problem. Now, again, we're making polymers out of it, and certainly polymers of acrylic acid, once it's polymerized, the safety aspect, once the styrene is polymerized into a product, is different on it. But, we, but underlying it, this, the, the fundamental safety that we have to build off of, uh, I think is a huge advantage and would be taken account for it. So it is around the performance that we can have relative to acrylic and styrene. It's the safety that we can have relative to them, and there's the sustainability of it. 
So again, what we are doing, and this is one of the most core parts, is that we just have a wonderful technology platform. I think we have 15 different port, um, patent portfolio uh, families of, of patents around protecting it. That's what we own as a company. Um, and as we go forward, we've already pulled three um, areas out of it. Um, and as we go forward, and particularly with the kind of funding that we have, um, our ability to continue to pull products out, um, you know, we have, 10 or 20 years worth of work to continue pulling uh, new opportunities out of this area. And just like the acrylic acid industry, which took 25 years to reach the size that it has today, that's also a path that I, I see ahead of us for Atacolix. So it's a um, really exciting part. And I think I think there's something with the success that we've had in commercializing, we're able to bring uh, to uh, to show new shareholders coming in of what the potential can be there. In terms of you know, so we have this great technology platform with hundreds of opportunities about it. The way we go about um, creating a new ingredient, I think is, um, uh, I've done it for many years in many different industries, but the way that um, that Avond Dr. Avon Durant and I, and, and, and particularly uh, Laura Danner over the few years have figured out how do we bring them forward? How do we make sure that we get really good ingredients that come forward that are gonna bring you performance, safety, cost improvement, and sustainability um, is a process that we're, we're actually going to be getting some, we have gotten recognition from in terms of a, a kind of, kind of a, a unique way we go about it. There is a special sauce around how we go about doing it. What we start with is an unmet need. We identify an unmet need, for example, in detergents, there was non-phosphate detergents. We look at what our, um, whether or not itaconic acid and the polymers we can make from it have some unique capability uh, to address it. We go out and we find, we go into the ignition stage to find, get the first three or four customers. You know, we think that um, if we put this ingredient in, we can go get a consumer product that has these claims that are gonna be customer facing claims that are gonna make a difference for how successful that product is gonna be on the shelf. And we wanna go prove to make sure that that's true. Um, once we prove that that's true, we then uh, can expand and get more, um, uh, more brands using it who want those claims on their product. Um, and then when you get through the traction side of it, now it becomes almost competitive pressure that if you aren't using our ingredient, you know, you're at risk of uh, the consumer, the, the downstream consumer product is at risk of losing market share. And if you think about where we are right now and the results that we have for our revenues, what you're seeing is that our automat and automatic dish detergent in certain regions for certain segments of the market, um, we're entering the takeoff stage there after many years of working our way through the ignition and traction area. Um, you won't see it on the revenue side of it, but in the beauty and in the hygiene area, we are working our way through the ignition and traction area. We are getting formulators going through. We are seeing uh, getting claims on end market products that are making a difference that are tied to our ingredients. So this is to be a continuous process for many years uh, as we continue to look at our technology platform, what we can do, make sure we identify a very important market need for it, connect the two and, and roll it out into it. And what you're seeing today in terms of our revenue results is that we finally have a company, have uh, our lead ingredient, our Itaconix TSI 322 entering the takeoff stage. I think we've, we've talked a lot about, you know, the, you know, the advantages we bring, but just to be clear about it, of what we can do, the functionality that our polymer brings in automatic dish is that um, when you take out the phosphates, there was a lot of extra materials that were put in to replace the functionality of managing water hardness so you don't have any spots or films on a glass. Um, and what we're able to do is, is take those formulas and reformulate and take a substantial amount of volume out of those uh, products. So we're replacing maybe two, three, four grams of material with, you know, one and a half, maybe one and a half grams of our material so that we get the, the, the dosage uh, to have excellent performance down. Uh, along the way, we're increasing the percentage of plant-based ingredients along the way, but what we really did is we got the, the dosage down on it. Um, that dosage translates into a lower cost per dose of the ingredient cost. So 
when you're buying a, a product, maybe for 20 cents or 30 cents on the shelf, remember the underlying ingredients really only cost three or four or five cents. So what we've done is we've been able to bring the that portion of what we do in, it, in, in the uh, formula, bring that cost down and that gives the cost advantages. So when in North America right now, when if you're a consumer and you go to the you go to the retail shelf, you think, oh, I'm going to get, I'm going to buy a, I want to buy a sustainable product. I'm going to buy palm olive, or I want to buy a really high performing product. Um, um, I'm going to buy Clorox, or you know, I want to save thirty to forty percent. I'm going to buy the private label brand. We're in all three of them. So regardless of what choice the consumer thinks they're making. Uh, around sustainability, we're bringing sustainability to all three categories um, because of the performance and cost that we bring to it. And I think that's one of the most powerful parts um, in terms of truly bringing um, sustainability uh, into the world and advancing the world to the low carbon economy is to be able to do it with performance, uh, performance and cost. John, if I may add there, so this goes back to your you know, the way that Atoponics develops products, you identify that unmet need, and then actually the secret is when you identify where can Atoponic acid, where can our technology make a difference, and that's when you progress into the next uh, into the next stage. And the beauty of Atoponic acid is, of course, that you have various ways to then tune that chemistry to reach that performance improvement, to reach that cost improvement with the inherently built-in sustainability. Exactly. Um, another area in beauty is the ability to uh, have a hair fix, to, to um, have uh, uh, fix the hair into a curl for uh, curl and hair styling. Um, we actually hold the um, hair to the kind of internal structure of the hair due to the chemistry that we have. Um, so you do not, you're not creating the traditional film on the outside of the hair that makes the, the curl kind of crusty. So what you get is obviously excellent curl retention, competitive to any of the other technologies out there, but you get this soft feel called weightless hairstyling or nude hairstyling. And on top of it, it's 100% plant-based. So um, if you want that soft, um, natural feeling curl with excellent performance, you need to be using our ingredient in it. Uh, we've had a little bit of a delay here, uh, then COVID caused a little bit of a delay in terms of how the hair market progressed. We expect that to be coming back on it. But again, if you want that effect, if the brand wants that effect, that claim, they need to be using our ingredient on it. And lastly, the, the, uh, the uh, odor control area, um, again, what we're doing is zinc has been used as a, for odor neutralization for many years. It's been well established. There's a product out there called uh, zinc rinse and oleate, uh, which, is, which is very effective at neutralizing odors, um, but it's fairly hard to formulate with. Um, uh, each pH range, as you go from a product that might have a pH of four to five to six, to seven to eight to nine, you have to work it very hard to go into formulation. Uh, and it also will leave a residue on any substrate, on a fabric uh, or on a carpet or somewhere. So what we do is um, it's a very good delivery system for zinc odor neutralization. It's fast acting. It has comparable formants to the zinc rinse and oleate, um, but it has the advantages of no residue and extremely, extremely easy to formulate into. Um, and on top of it, it's plant-based. So again, it's the, the, it, there's other attributes to it. Um, we supply, uh, Crota has been out there uh, in the home care area doing very well with Zinador. Um, we also market ourselves directly under our Vela Fresh product line. Um, you'll find it in carpet cleaning products, air freshening products. Um, we have it in uh, aluminum free underarm deodorants, pet care products, um, tremendous advantages that we have that we think will, uh, will grow forward. But so three examples of how we did see a market opportunity tied it to our unique chemistry uh, to bring products forward uh, with, with um, claims um, on a consumer product brand that other ingredients can't bring. 
Well, we've had it, what, what's great in terms of building a great specialty chemical company is you keep building up, you get formulated in, you just keep on building up more and more brands that are using it. Um, and we have advanced, uh, you know, we're in a broad range of, um, of uh, automatic dish brands, both branded and private label ones. We're in uh, air fresheners, carpet cleaners, uh, hairsprays. Uh, uh, dog sprays, all sorts of one. But now uh, the total, we're, we believe we're over 100. Um, we can identify 145, I think, that we're in. We're probably in a few more than that. It's, it's a little hard to keep track of all of it. But most important to creating a successful company is have a diversified base of formulations where you're where you're, you're used in it and you're a critical ingredient to the success of that brand. Um, and that's what we've done here. Those brands, uh, once you get into it, when you really get the revenue growth is when those brands um, progress out into the marketplace and get more market share. And where, where you really see it is that they get more and more listings at more and more retailers. So now in North America, when you go into pretty much every major retailer, you are going to find um, uh, multiple products that um, have our ingredients uh, sitting on the retail shelf. And we use North America as a leading indicator for us, not because we're our operations there, it's just the structure of the formulation market. It, um, they use third-party formulators a little bit more, so it's a little bit easier for access. So we can establish success in, in North America um, and then transfer that into other regions of the world. So we look at North America as a leading indicator uh, for growth. Um, so over the last, um, uh, you know, we look at kind of what's the revenue per thousand homes um, and make sure we're, we're penetrating the household in terms of usage. We've been running almost 70% compound annual growth in North America, and that's translating to about 60% compound annual growth across Europe and Europe and North America. And, you know, in major brand, you know, ma major retailers throughout, you'll see that we're getting into more and more um, EU-based um uh, retailers, Carrefour, Tesco, Rossmans, uh, and then as you get into, uh, into into North America, pretty much every major retailer, um, we have some presence there. So that's really the, 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 the secondary growth as you get into the formula of a product, and then that product continues to grow by getting into more and more retailers. <laughs> The combined effect of that is that um, is the tremendous growth that we've seen. Um, you can see on a half to half basis is a little bit of a, uh, uh, we had that little bit of a bump in the second half of 2022, but remember underlying, that was an inventory adjustment, but underlying growth, 63% uh, compound annual growth over the last four years, uh, really a breakthrough years in terms of overall revenues for us, uh, mainly in cleaning, as I said before, um, and, uh, and you know, that this is a very high quality uh, base of revenues, of recurring revenues that we're going to continue to build, continue to build on into the future of it. So um, it's got buried a little bit in the fundraising side is just how well um, uh, 2020, uh, 2022 went for us in terms of commercial progress of it. In terms of um, what happened in the second half, we had continued reorder volumes. Uh, we were able to get um, some recovery in our gross profit margins, uh, not all the way that we'd like to, but we significant recovery in it. We put some price increases through. We put in um, uh, another price increase through fairly recently, so to make sure that we uh, are getting towards our target gross profit margin. Uh, vastly different world in terms of the stability of material of our raw material costs, they've stabilized significantly in the supply chain, the shipping, the shipping times and the shipping costs for both um, incoming and outgoing materials have uh, substantially improved. Um, uh, so we're facing a much more stable uh, world uh, in terms of our uh, supply chain uh, incoming and outgoing. Uh, the next major area for growth for us is in Europe. Um, we have uh, new cleaning customers that did advance to launches uh, and are now into recurring orders. Uh, and we have some initial uh, traction on some major new projects in, uh, in Europe um, that will be coming through the first half of this year. 
Um, we also last year we re, uh, we renewed uh, some important uh, agreements that we had with both Crota and Nurion, uh, and we added uh, Brentag North America. Um, so we are continuing to increase our market reach into both cleaning, beauty, and hygiene. Uh, that now, now that you know you have this positive effect, now you go out and you have that confidence is to go out into more and more channels to be able to grab more revenues out of it. Well, we look for um, in 2023, we're going to continue to gain uh, market share in dishwashing detergents. We'll have more North American volumes, more traction in Europe, uh, and we're already working on the next generation, even the further generation of North American automatic dish formulations uh, that we hope to roll out in 2024 with some new customers on it. Uh, we are bringing new hygiene products um, and beauty products to the market. Uh, we have a, uh, in the next few months, we'll be launching Velisoft BR300, which is a new, uh, a new polymer for us um, that's used for preventing uh, and repairing um, uh, hair damage. We actually are able to go in and restore the bonds, uh, the protein bonds in the hair um, uh, to get much healthier, uh, healthier, softer hair on it. Um, that will be coming out. Uh, it's the beginning of some new technologies. We're going to bring into hair care. Um, we have some new beauty products in, in the in the odor control. Some new forms that we're going to come to the market with, and to go out into new marketing channels for it. Um, one area that is um, you know uh, continues to progress, not quite as fast as I would like, but um, I think that the fundraise will help us. Is that we need a little bit more equipment um, to get our super absorbent. Uh, to make some additional modifications to our super absorbent um, to get to the performance competitive performance level that we're looking for. Um, so we will be using some of our uh, some of our fundraise to bring in some equipment for that. Um, and we think that will allow us to make commercial progress in 2024. Um, and then also in our composites, the, the patent that we have in the composites area, we expect to be, we are seeking partners there and hope to make some progress there. So another, another good year in terms of uh, commercial progress coming up ahead. When we think about um, how, our, how our revenues develop, um, the most important area of growth that we have this year will be our existing customers. Any particular year, our biggest growth is just from the products that are out there just being more successful out in the marketplace. The second area of growth is, um, is the new accounts that we brought on in 2022. We'll actually get a full year's revenue out of them, uh, and that will give us kind of locked in growth. And the last pit is our, you know, is our you know, $30 million customer project pipeline of getting some wins there. And we have some very nice uh, wins uh, potentials there, some new North American detergents accounts that we could be quite large, some new uh, European detergent accounts, and then we have a number of smaller ones, um, both in detergent uh, in the detergent areas and in uh, new odor control ones uh, that are sizable ones. So we um, um, we expect to get uh, continued success in our custom product pipeline. But in terms of relying on those to hit our 2023 numbers, most of it's already baked into our um, to our existing customer structure. So we arrived at just a, a, a very exciting stage of development for the company. Uh, we, with revenue growth, with, with the kind of revenue growth we have relative to our cost, our, our operating cost basis, you, we're, you know, you can see the path that we have towards profitability. We, you know, we continue to bring our, uh, we don't lose a lot of money in the first place. Uh, and we continue to bring those down uh, and uh, those lines will cross. Um, um, and it's all around that bringing the performance cost and sustainability um, to it, developing that large customer base of uh, recurring high quality revenues, um, having a large proprietary technology base to continue to over the next 10 to 20 years, we're going to continue to go back and use that um, our new product uh, development process to bring new um, highly valuable ingredients forward. Uh, and we're doing that with no uh, very like, almost no direct uh, no direct competition of anybody making our exact polymers in it. Um, in each formulation area, you're competing against another a particular other technology in it. But in terms of someone actually making our polymers, uh, we're not aware of that, nor do we ever see it in the marketplace. 
we're doing with low capital intensity with our existing plant. You know, we have, uh, I stated many times, you know, ability to go to 15, 20, over $20 million in revenues just with the plant that we have. Uh, we're going to continue to build off of that um, and uh, improve and improve our um, our ability to run to, to run that plant on it. So low capital needs going forward of it. And again, just this wonderful base of recurring revenues uh, to, to build off of. So um, uh, it's an exciting time uh, for um, for our existing shareholders that have us in such a strong place with a strong balance sheet. It's an exciting time um, uh, for our new shareholders who've come on board. Very exciting to have them on board uh, to rebuild our institutional shareholder base um, and, uh, and, and for us to be able to have uh, the resources that we need um, you know, for many years going forward uh, to continue to build out a um, large, um, highly profitable specialty ingredients company. If I, um, if I may add there, uh, John, is to, 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 to share you know, what, what has driven my enthusiasm, amongst others, about this technology is two things on this, uh, on this chart. So the first of all, first one is the, the low capital intensity. And I've, I've seen very many um, scale-ups, startups uh, in the industry, <coughs> almost inevitably, you need a lot of money to build a commercial, uh, a commercial facility. Um, it is absolutely unique uh, to see what uh, what you and what uh, and, and what Yvonne and the team have pulled off in this uh, in this sense, um, and this this should be uh, a, a a unique strength going forward. The other one, which is actually related to uh, the inherent quality of that uh, of that technology, which was uh, developed, of course, by Yvonne Durand, Dr. Yvonne Durand is the low level of direct competition. I think I know of no plant-based ingredient company that is actually alone in uh, bringing this, uh, this technology to market. So these are two really big strengths. Um, uh, and, and on top of that, there is the large market that you can grow into. There is indeed the stickiness of sales. Once you have achieved sales in the chemical industry, they're very sticky. But these two things from a very early um, early day really caught my eye, and I believe that will be pillars for for future growth. Excellent. So we will um, uh, want to make sure we get to everybody's uh, uh, questions uh, and uh, be able to address everyone's questions. I think Lou, I can move to the Q and A on it. I believe. John, Peter, thank you very much for your presentation this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the top right corner of your screen. Just while the company take a few moments to review those questions submitted today, I'd like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your investor dashboard. John, Peter, as you can see, we have received a number of questions throughout today's presentation, and thank you to all investors for submitting their questions. Could I please ask you to read out the questions and give responses where it's appropriate to do so, and I'll pick up from you at the end. Great. We'll start at the top. Uh, in the past, John has talked about one day having a biorefinery. Are there now plans to take this forward, or alternatively, are there any plans to invest in a new production facility in Europe? Um, I have said that my vision um, uh, it's many years out is that we will have a fully integrated plant uh, of an idaconic acid plant, uh, probably that we partner with, not that we own, um, and we will have our facility tied to that, um, producing a broad range of high value added ingredients. Um, my uh, hope and dream is that there'll eventually be one in North America and one in Europe. Um, that's a very long time horizon on it. Um, that is not within the, any of our immediate plans right now, nor, nor does it fall into any of the money that we've raised today. Um, in terms of a new production facility in Europe, um, we have, uh, you know, we're still operating at 20% of capacity in our North American plant. Um, one of our biggest opportunities to increase our profit margins is to run that plant uh, at a higher uh, utilization rate. Um, so we are not planning uh, any new production facility in Europe at this time. Uh, what we are looking at is ways to continue to improve the um, hourly throughput rate and uptime 
um, of our existing plant and using some capital to do, to do that. And we can expand the capacity there for a relatively small amount. Second question is within, with the recent appointment of um, Paul LeBlanc, um, will there be a direct or indirect working relationship with Bemis? Um, Paul LeBlanc is the CFO of uh, Bemis. Um, wonderful experience there. He uh, took it from a relatively small company to a very major player. Um, and he is on our uh, on our board and specifically head of our audit committee because of his experience as an operating CFO of the phase of the challenges that a company goes as they go from five to 10 to 20 to 50. There's some, you know, growth, growth can be very challenging in terms of the systems you have in place. Paul is a excellent uh, operating CFO with that kind of experience of it. And that's why he's on our board. Bemis, the company he works for, is an excellent, uh, uh, excellent company. Um, they, their applications and our technology do not have any direct apparent um, ties, um, but um, you know, but excellent companies, uh, you know, will always be on the lookout for opportunities. But there's nothing um, related to his appointment in terms of any relationship between the company, other than Paul was by far the best candidate um, for what our needs are. Uh, going forward. Uh, next, would you um, describe your private label versus branded mix where your products are being used as ingredients? Please share data for different product lines. Um, within, um, I can really only speak to uh, in our cleaning area. Remember, a lot of the brands that happen um, that Nurion gets in hairstyling and that Crota gets in home care. Um, we don't have direct access to that. And even some of, we work through some distributors, we don't see direct access to it. Where I can speak to is in the automatic dish detergent area, um, we are bringing low cost, high performing, sustainable uh, ingredients in that area. And it works uh, for both um, branded and for private label. Um, I, um, the specific counts, a lot of these products get produced at the one or two facilities. Usually they use all these brands use third party contract manufacturers. So exactly how it and how the pro, the volumes that we end up go up into different areas. Um, but in terms of um, the efficacy that we have and the competitive advantage that we give, uh, it works equally in private label and in branded areas of it. And I think the example I gave uh, earlier of a consumer sitting in front of the retail shelf and the types of choices they think they're making, we're in all three of them. So it doesn't make you know, almost, we, we want to be in every category uh, that the customer makes because of the capabilities that our chemistry has. Next question, could you give uh, some sense of the number of brands that are currently evaluating your products to use um, uh, as their ingredients? Um, our, um, our customer pipeline is about $30 million. Uh, it may even be a little bit higher now. We've had some uh, very good progress. I think going out in some of the some of the efforts that we did in the last six months to expand our channels is bringing in some very good opportunities. In terms of the actual number of products, I don't know. I'm a numbers guy, so I think about revenues more than I think about products. So um, uh, it's $30 million plus in terms of potentials in terms of active projects that we have. Uh, next, are you prioritizing break even or faster growth? Um, it is, um, it, there's always a balance between it. Um, I think that um, I, I, uh, I, I don't, um, I don't like, uh, I would like to be profitable of it. I think uh, we have the revenue growth that we have um, should get us to profitability on it. Uh, uh, on it, and we should get there uh, as soon as as soon as we can without cutting off our faster growth. Where we are right now is our existing business of, in the cleaning, beauty, and hygiene. We're going to be a very profitable, some size company. I don't know if it's you know twenty million or twenty five or thirty. I, I, I can't tell you, but it's going to be it's a highly profitable business that we've already built and are operating. What the next one to do is. To um, our next goal is to be a hundred million dollar company, and that's what we're going to be looking at in our product, in our project pipeline. New products to bring forward is now we need some bigger swings out there. 
I think we can do that. We're going to do that within the context of what are available uh, of our operating structure that we have now. Uh, and I don't, you know, I really do not want to be deferring off uh, break even uh, that much uh, in, in terms of uh, that. You know, we'll be hovering right around there in the next couple of years uh, on it. Uh, and um, uh, but the remember the underlying ambition is to make sure that we're a hundred million dollar company and that we do bring uh, product uh, opportunities forward to do that. Um, David, you said last year that a quote on Nasdaq or other U.S. market was scheduled. You were talking of a shareholder consolidation to facilitate this. Where are we with this? Um, I, we talked about a share consolidation um, for the purpose that uh, our existing, uh, we still have a, a significant base of uh, shares held in the U.S., um, uh, myself included. Uh, and one of the issues we have with our share price right now is that our U.S. shareholders cannot hold their shares. Uh, uh, the brokerage firms will not hold our shares uh, in a brokerage account. And that's a, that's a major issue for us um, on it. So uh, we are looking at share consolidation. Um, we did a, uh, we made some assumptions about kind of where, what price we needed to get to in dollar terms and where our share price would be um, in terms of uh, what we had approved last year. Now that we're through the fundraise, we'll go have a chance to go back and revisit that. Um, I don't think I said anything about, I don't think I've ever said anything about quoting on NASDAQ. We already are in the OTC market, so we are quoted uh, on the OTC market as, as it stands. I don't recall, um, I don't recall saying anything about NASDAQ on that one, um, on it. Uh, but we have talked about, um, you know, so the share consolidation, uh, we still expect it to happen. Um, I think we'll, it'll be a discussion that we take under consideration over the next uh, few months on it. Um, Next question, which is the most popular alternative to Idaconics ingredients being used in your customer markets? It, uh, good question. It varies dramatically um, from every product area. Um, it varies. In automatic dish detergents, there's tends, the, the, the formulations we're competing against is there tends to be a small molecule chelate and an acrylate polymer that are used, uh, and we're taking out both of those and replacing it with just our polymer. Uh, in uh, hairstyling, uh, we're replacing uh, film former, traditional film formers, um, which are tend to be fossil based uh, uh, products, traditional film former ones, and we're substituting it with a product that has a different functionality to hold the hair on it. Um, so th there, and then in, uh, in odor control, uh, and there's all sorts of, probably the biggest thing we do in odor control is people are using fragrances to mask uh, odors as opposed to actually neutralizing them. Because I actually think the zinc rinse and oleate market has been growing, we're growing in it. So I think that probably the biggest competitor in that is people um, trying to re reduce the amount of fragrance uh, they're using to mask odors and actually neutralizing them. So um, again, there's no, every segment that we go into, there's a slightly, we're up against a competing formula with some competing ingredients used to it. There's no one, um, there's no one alternative that goes across all of our platforms. And to add to that, so this is actually a feature of the ingredients industry, lots of them, chemical companies, very many different applications. You go into one application, you'll find four competitors. You go into another application, you'll find three different competitors. Sometimes there are overlaps, sometimes there are not. So you have to take it application by application. That's great. Can you please talk about your competitors and their strengths and effects on your business? I would say the biggest, um, when you get up into the largest brand, the, 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 there's, there's two segments of the, of the kind of ingredient uh, ingredient uh, brand uh, market. There's the smaller brands where uh, ingredients come out, uh, formulas try all sorts of different ingredients uh, and, and they, um, and, and, you know, it's just how well it performs. At some of the highest levels, when you get up into some of the, 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 the global brands, they tend to have, they continue to have a five-year development project 
with one of the majors, with a you know, one of the, the, the really large global chemical companies, and they will actually develop a new chemistry with the brand. And as part of that, when the chemistry company actually goes and builds the plant, they'll get a long-term contract. So um, when you look at our product list, you can see our brands, um, our ability to break into the very high, the very largest global brands uh, can be quite challenging in terms of the relationships and how those relationships work and the amount of uh, resources that you have to do it and the contractual obligations that they have that go over many, many years. So I would say that's the biggest one in terms of um, you know, our ability to break into that next tier uh, is that you really, you know, you have to be in business for quite a number of years for them to come in to, to, to put you into that category on it. Um, John, so just to interrupt you also in light of, uh, in light of time. Um, so there's quite a few questions of David and Sidert and we cannot see if there are others that have I questions can, that we would like to pick first. I can, and I think this session I can stops at the hour, is it not? What time is it? We have 10 minutes, less than 10 okay, minutes. Okay, 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 okay. Um, what are your core patents? Sorry. Um, we have 15 product we have 15 categories. Um, they they're you know we still have a life on on all of them. Uh, it's a, it, it's a, it's a very broad range of uh, product families of it. It's hard to say in, in each one of them are stacked on top of each other. So we think we have patent protection for many, many years to come. Uh, if you see any plant-based competitor on the horizon, um, I, again, it kind of goes back to, it, it, there is no one competitor. Every, a, every product category has a different set of uh, competitors in it. Uh, so it's hard to make a, a blanket statement on that one. And just to emphasize there, in itoconic acid, there is no competitor at this level of development. Yeah. Um, uh, John, uh, and this technology here is great, but should this not be advertised more widely for Good exposure? Question. Um, again, we, um, uh, our best advertisement is the success of the brands that we get into. Formulators keep a very close track of other formulations. Um, you, know, um, you know, we can do more. Uh, we'll have the resources to do a little bit more. But in general, um, uh, we're pretty well known um, within a within a class of, of, of formulators for a certain type of product. We're usually pretty well known. I wouldn't say lack of awareness is a problem that we have on it. Um, when are we going to see Idaconics on the list of ingredients on the products I buy? Um, they are listed on it. I mean, and there are. People keep track of it. We have inky names. So when you see sodium polyadiconate, idiconate, you know, uh, you know, sulfonated copolymer, you know, we are, every customer has to list us, our ingredient on their, uh, on their ingredient list. What percentage of your products are, um, I can't quite, um, what percentage of your product base has reached the takeoff phase? And what percentage are almost there? Um, we are uh, are are in North America in the um, uh, North American automatic dish detergent market. We're in takeoff stage. Um, we're still in the traction uh, stage um, uh, in in Europe for that. And then in the uh, the other two are in the traction take uh, traction ignition area on that. Next is um, what uh, sales revenues and time scales do you envision to be net profitable? And secondly, what is your gross profit percent targets? Um, our goal is to be well above is to be above thirty five percent gross profit margin overall. Um, um, you know our revenues are growing. Um, you know you can see when the you know the rev you know the revenues and our cost basis revenues are growing faster than our cost base. So you can expect to see that you know. You know, in the in the coming years, on it, it's not going to be indefinite. Um, I think we already talked about the competitors and strength effects on the business. Yeah, Adrian, can you ensure supply chain stability through global diversity, given the changing geopolitical ones? Uh, the only source of itoconic acid right now is out of China. Um, you know, I think there are people looking at it, um, and we'll see. We'll keep we keep very close tabs, and everybody wants to talk to me about it. Talk to us about it. You say there's currently a low level of 
do you anticipate this session to be in five years time? Uh, we don't see anybody in terms of someone making itaconase like we make, uh, we don't expect that in the next five years. Uh, and super observed, how big is the revenue opportunity for itaconase? Which end products drive it? We're in the early stages of that. Super absorbance is a huge market on it. Um, and um, so that's a, uh, a very, that, that's a, um, you know, there's lots of opportunity in there. When, uh, when will you hit uh, 20 million revenues? That's, you know, sometime in the future. We're growing fast. Um, does something like the mass recall of Fabuloso Cleaner impact? No, it does not. Um, I don't, not, not familiar with that one. We are not in Fabuloso. Uh, we do not have any product recalls that I know that affect us. Um, can you confirm that all excess applications from existing qualifying shareholders have been accepted? I believe so, yes. And thank you for answering my questions. Thank you. Wow, we hit, we got all the questions. All right. That's a, you know, uh, on it. Uh, those are great questions. So thank you, guys. John, thank Peter, you. thank you. And I think you've addressed all those questions you can from investors. And of course, the company will review all questions submitted today, and we will publish those responses on the Investor Meet Company platform. Before redirecting investors to provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to the company, John, could I please just ask you for a few closing comments? Um, it's just the, the so the the excitement that we have of entering a new phase of growth um, with a strong balance sheet, uh, with the commercial success that we have, with the commercial pipeline that we customer pipeline we have in front of us. Um, you know, I've always been enthusiastic about it. I, I've known this was coming, but to be able to show the outside world um, exactly what we are doing with this kind of success and show the outside world and to get investor, you know, new institutions coming in to invest uh, behind it is just a, you know, it's just a, a both a validation of what we've done uh, and, a, uh, and a, a, a very good indication of what we're gonna do in the future. It's been a, a very exciting, um, a very exciting uh, couple months for us. And we look forward to continuing to show uh, uh, the steady progress that we've had. John P. John, Peter, thank you for updating investors today. Can I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete and I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Itaconics PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. Good afternoon to you all.